Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, Maryland. For three months in 1999, ABC News was given unprecedented access inside one of America's leading hospitals. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a team of journalists was allowed to witness intimate, candid moments, what really goes on inside a hospital. Now, some of those stories on Hopkins 24-7. It is one of the most prestigious names in American medicine, celebrated for its cutting-edge medical research and the caliber of its faculty. But to the disadvantaged residents of Baltimore's inner city, Johns Hopkins often means the closest emergency room. Hopkins. Patient's complaining of uh, head pain, left shoulder, right foot, and right shin. Patient has no medical history. Dr. Christina Catlett has been a supervising physician in the emergency department for two years. We'll see in triage. The emergency department is a world of its own. All right, dinner's gonna have to wait. I have yet to find another part of the hospital that rivals the organized chaos that we have in the emergency department. Look at me. A gentleman found belligerent, drunk, but has facial trauma, possible head injury, so we're, he, he needs to be sedated, he needs to be boarded and collared, yada, yada, yada. I kind of came into this job completely naive. You know, I've lived in my little white bread world all my life, and I, I have no experience with what our patients deal with. <laughs> did, you, did you get high tonight? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Did. did you get some bad stuff, you think? No. Coke and heroin or just one or the other? No. Yeah. yeah. Looks like you're speedballing pretty hard. There you go. Yeah. A lot of them have no money, no health insurance, no job, horrible health problems. And um, when I first came here, I had no way to relate to those kind of patients. But you learn and you, you ask them questions. They're very open with us. And you try to learn from their experiences and, and assimilate that into your practice so that you can be more accepting and you know you don't want to be judgmental of the patients they're doing the best that they can with the life that they have the thing, the thing about this getting in detox and all that right see it if you leave it if you leave it up to an addict to do it it won't get taken care of it won't get done if y'all got something positive that will help me hey i'll go for it you know? i'll do it. i'll do my best the majority of what we see in the emergency department, the majority of our traumas, is either the ravages of drugs, meaning health issues related to drugs, or violence related to drugs. Incoming. My role during the trauma is mainly supervisory. Is that a shooting? What happened? This guy in the bar. Was a shooting? Yeah, trying to break his leg. Two holes in the buttocks. I'm still in the process of learning how not to want to do everything myself. What do you need? And just uh, just kind of watch things and, and supervise rather than being as hands-on as I used to be. Antonio, your mom's not home. She's out grocery shopping. You need an operation and you need to go up right now. We can't wait for your mom, all right? You're 18 years old. If you understand everything I told you, you need to sign this form so we can take you upstairs. I don't. You don't what? Antonio, let me explain it to you. If we don't do anything, you can lose your leg, right? You can lose your leg, right? If we don't do anything, you can get an infection in your belly that kills you, right? Now, do you understand? We didn't shoot you. We're here to say, Antonio, it's 8.30. Time is a waste, and we need to go upstairs, all right? Sign right at that X. When was your last good. tetanus shot? I'm not sure. All right. You give him a tetanus yeah. and a gram of answer. Okay. Thanks. Every single day, I am so glad that I chose emergency medicine. Every single day, it's different, it's exciting, emotionally rewarding. I really wanted to be a surgeon, came very close to applying to the surgery programs, and at the last minute did my emergency medicine rotation and fell in love with it. And there was no question that that was what I wanted to specialize in. I also love the chaos. Mm -hmm. this, this to me, this, this melee is what I thrive in. Dr. Catlett's colleague, Chris Williams, has made the opposite choice, opting to stay out of the ER and pursue a surgical career. At three o'clock in the morning, and people are yelling and screaming, and there's too much going on at one time. And I, I really need a blue, a little, you know, operating room with a blue light or a light in a field about this big, 
uh, to really get focused. And also the At 27, fresh out of medical school, Chris Williams is on the bottom rung of Hopkins' hierarchy of doctors. I always feel like I'm getting further and further behind, actually. Until it gets like midnight, then you feel, then you feel like you're Williams is a things. lowly intern, a first-year resident in a program that will take him another seven years to become a surgeon. This is how fast can you do paperwork? The intern is the ant, the worker ant. You know, he gets the labs done, he gets the studies done, he's supposed to know more about the patient than anybody else. And so when anybody else above him says, hey, what's going on, that, that person, man or woman, is supposed to be able to say, this is what's going on. He was one of 35 interns selected by the Department of Surgery from over 700 applications. And you learn to speak faster, too, as a doctor. It's Dr. Ease. Did so you learn how to speak Dr. Ease? Speak without breathing. Speak without breathing. Work without eating. Walk fast. Eat fast. Don't sleep. And this is the surprise that you live for. Free food. Uh-oh, that's, that's my chief. This could be interesting. Tell me about what happened. Okay, so I talked to, talked to his primary care physician. Good. He's going to follow up with uh, her. Each month, the surgical interns rotate to a different department. This month, Williams is based in oncology, and his chief resident is Dr. Julianne Sosa. How much coumadin did we send him? 7.5. Always there is one rule of thumb. Keep the chief resident happy. Good job. All right, so, terrific. This is my peripheral brain, which weighs about five pounds. This is how you look good. Where is my list? Dr. Dooley, for example, when he's closing his uh, wounds, his incisions, he likes to use a 3 vicral with a subcutaneous suture and uh, 3 proline on a straight needle. Don't forget the straight needle. And there's a loop with the, so all the secrets. So when you see it once and then you remember, they think you're real hot. You know, they think you're smart, but actually just kept in your peripheral brain. <laughs> Most of the time, his real brain is numb with exhaustion. God, I'm tired. There are 168 hours in a week. Williams says some weeks he works up to 140 hours, a brutal test of endurance by any measure. You don't quite understand what a 140-hour work week is until you actually work one. A normal week for Williams means three nights on call, where he gets little or no sleep at all. A shower, shave, and a fresh pair of socks. And you're an entirely different person. For many Hopkins physicians, uh, being able to function on no sleep is a job requirement. On this night, the hospital's pediatric transport team is summoned to meet an emergency flight coming from Indiana. The child that we're getting today is a three and a half year old being transported from South Bend, Indiana. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry, Alex. On board, right. they find Alexandria Moody, right. a little girl with a history of seizures that are getting worse by the hour. She's three and a half. She weighs 17.4 kilos. We'll be there in about a half hour or so. OK, Alex had three seizures on the airplane itself. She has a history of seizures, but the seizures have changed in that she has now having apneic spells. In other words, she stops breathing when she seizes. Alex's mother and stepfather have been told an aneurysm, a blood clot, in the brain maybe causing the seizures. We were rushed out here with the assumption that Alex could have an aneurysm, an aneurysm that could basically burst at any time. Alex has seizures. Saturday morning, she's had, she had three real serious seizures in a row where her lips and around her mouth was turning purple, okay, which okay. gave us indication that she wasn't breathing. You said her lips were turning blue, but what now, activity does she have? Her head and she, eyes do this. Okay. And we'd have no idea where this has come from. If within Three weeks, we have such, saw such a major change in Alexandria. Her seizures are worse. She's not breathing. Her lips are turning blue. What if, they, what if it grows just a little bit more to really cause some damage? Are you guys doing an MRI tonight? Don't know yet. We're talking to neurology and neurosurgery, and they're going to see what can they can do. Can we request an MRI tonight to get this thing going? Oh, well, we're trying to get things done as quick as we can. Oh, really? OK. So. Can you order an MRI tonight? Um, it depends on whether there's room in the MRI scanner. Alex's parents were told before coming here that an MRI, a scan of her brain, would show the location of an aneurysm. 
The problem is they, they, know, yep. they don't know the depth yeah. into right. the brain. Right. And so your team is not going to know how serious it is. If exactly. I'm not mistaken, until you get the depth. Right. The so, bottom line so, is you will need that MRI, so right. why don't we go oh, ahead and get absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're Wait, trying to expedite that as quickly you know, as we can. I, we just have to understand they've had her in ICU, okay, right. in South Bend, Indiana, because she's not breathing when she has her seizures. So we feel this is serious. I mean, if it was serious enough for them to feel like we need to fly her here, you know, spend $5,500 to fly her here, you know. Then they can do an MRI. Right. Everybody wants everything done now, but if it's not the best thing for the patient, we're not going to do it now, and that's sad. I'm pissed. We do not have any of our questions answered about Alex. We have drove hundreds of miles. No sleep. The stress is ungodly. Patricia Evans will have to wait until morning to find out if an aneurysm is threatening her daughter's life. Alex has passed the night uneventfully. I know what you can do. Sing me a song. Say, you are my, my only. At last, it is time for the MRI the family's been waiting for. The results are a complete surprise. There is no aneurysm in Alex's brain, but there does appear to be a developmental defect. You know, the MRI shows an area of the brain which is abnormal and is probably responsible for the weakness and the seizures, but it doesn't look like anything that's a malignant tumor or any type of a vascular problem or any type of an active infection. Our suspicion is that probably the entire left side of the brain has developed in an abnormal way. For Alex's mother, the new information brings relief, but also frustration as she tries to learn if any treatment exists to help her daughter. That what are we the looking case, at before we, we have track. a true answer? Are we looking at a week? Well, again, you know, I cannot answer some of these questions right away. Dr. Freeman and Dr. Vining tomorrow will tell you what they want to do and when they can do it. So they're the head honchos in this case. What if they you say will. go? If you will, yes. We came from small town into the big city, and we were not truly understanding how the bigger city of hospitals operate. I mean, we were. We were overwhelmed with all of the resident doctors. We're more used to a family physician may refer you to a surgeon. The surgeon takes care of the problem, and you're done. You ever see one of these before? The first seizures are changing. I want to know why. If they can't tell me an answer, then I want them to do something. It's else. a long-term thing. They've got you've got to allow them time to decide what course of action you're, they're going to take. Gonna, what take another week? Trish, do another test, and then another week. Wait a minute. Let me finish. If, if they have no medication to take care of it. And you say, but they're going to do something. What are they going to John, do? John, I'm sorry. You forget. We've got two other children, okay? We can't just keep bringing... No, it's not nothing towards Alex. I mean, I want the best for her, but we've got two other There's children. There's no other options, but do what you got to do, whatever that is. If that means both of us quit our job and starting our lives over, then that's what we got to do. We've got no choice but to do what we've got to do for Alex, okay? I realize that, and I don't want it to sound like that. I don't want to do what I... We, but what I'm saying is I don't want us to be put off because they don't have time for us. Does that make sense? That's fair. Okay. Delta trauma, ETA, one minute. Delta trauma, ETA, one minute. Yes. This lady that's been in the CEU over 24 hours that was stressed, yes. it's going to be restressed. Can I take her off the monitor? Because we don't have another set of leads back there. No, no. Okay. She's only done one part of her stress test. And the only reason we're keeping her is to monitor. So she does need to stay on a monitor. Okay. All right, I got to go back and say. We do work hard and we work long hours. And it's toughest when you're the only attending emergency physician who's here and every single patient has to go through you. And you're trying to guide six to eight residents at one time, all of whom need some direction on the 35 to 40. 40 patients that are in the department. Yes, Mike, let's go ahead and put her on the monitor. Let's get an EKG on her. I try to know what's going on at all times. Did you check his labs yet? No labs the same. Yes, they were. We sent... Um, because 
You, you're ultimately responsible for everything that's occurring in the department. So can you check those and see if they're back yet? If they weren't sent, then that's an oversight because they were supposed to be sent. It was really difficult going into the the position of authority of being an attending physician, and particularly when I first started. Yeah, I'm getting right She's now. got a, a two to three centimeter wound got just here. below her scapula. The first day I was an attending, I actually threw up on the way to work. I was so nervous. You know, you go from June 31st, being a resident, to July 1st, suddenly you're the attending, you're in charge, and it's I mean, it was it was frightening. Go ahead and put the wound marker on. Ma'am, how's your belly? And it was even more difficult because I'm still young and I'm female, which as much as I would love to say that there is complete equality at Johns Hopkins, it's still got a little bit of the, the old school, um, you know, boy school attitude. You're going to need this room for the second Delta. You have a more serious Delta coming in. This is a serious Delta. No, not this one, is it? No, that's this one's going to Right, that's what I meant. So I'm sending this one up to room one, because that's your less serious. One of the wonderful things about emergency medicine is that as hard as you work during a shift, and as frantic as the pace gets, and as frustrated as you get, at the end of your shift, you go home, and you turn the beeper off, and you relax. Unlike our colleagues in the surgery department, who have endless hours. They're here in the hospital for days at a time. It, it, it's a much more difficult lifestyle. It's been very, very busy, very hectic. And my beeper actually, uh, the battery actually ran out. Uh, so, because I got beeped so often. It's one of those days where you want to throw your beeper down the toilet. I'm gonna go call my medical student. We're gonna see what else needs to be done. Oh. She beat me to it. You learn the rules by crossing the boundaries and then being chastised. Hey, Chris? Yes. Can we send someone to find his nurse the bowel prep has to that's, start That's with? what it did. Yeah, right Bethany's on, on top of them right now. It's 3.30 and you should have already gotten a dose okay. of yeah. the Yeah. No, Mr. Long. Who's his nurse? You have a patient with a certain disease and you go, you know, what is my attending going to think? What is my chief going to think if I don't treat this patient correctly? There's a lot of anxiety, I think. Ruth. Ruth. Yes. We need to start his bowel prep ASAP. Yeah, Mr. Long. As soon as we can. There's a fine line between fear and learning. One of the best motivators, unfortunately, is fear. Someone bolused Ms. with uh, normal saline. Her sodium is 150. That How could mean. that have happened? That was, that was okay. mean. So from now on, I've just on changed second. her carrier over to LR. LR okay. bolus is only 150. Okay. She's going to go into hypernatrium of coma. Okay. One delta was downgraded, so we now have two deltas and an alpha. We see so much trauma that it can become routine to you. Delta go in here, the less serious delta here, and the alpha go. Part of that is a defense mechanism. You try not to let every single case gnaw at you because you're going to go crazy if you do. So you guys need to divide and conquer. For certain cases, your emotions become involved even when you don't want them to. You're doing okay. okay. You're doing okay. okay. I know, I know. And you see her laying there in the bed. Her legs are mangled. Oh, she's in as much shock as we are that she's been struck down in her wheelchair like a dog in the middle of the road. Hey, me. Yeah. They knocked me out of the wheelchair. Yeah. Oh. I mean, every single year, you add another notch to your belt, and you think you've seen it all, and then something else will walk in that completely shocks you. I have some broken bones. That's why you're hurting, OK? Stay with me, all right? Wait, here, pull my hand. Our department is a constant lesson in human nature. She was hit by a car, or somebody dumped her out of her no, wheelchair. In a wheelchair. Oh. Wheelchair smashed by the car with her in it. Wheelchair completely gone. Unrecognizable. Who hit her? A car. Did they stop? <laughs> <laughs> they hit a woman in a wheelchair well, and did not three stop. three people and they didn't stop. They hit oh her, my God. the lady next door, and the gentleman that just had a cut on his leg. Oh, that's awful. That's awful. Alex's parents have spent another anxious night by their daughter's bedside, waiting to hear if doctors have a treatment to stop her seizures. Leading the team examining Alex's case is neurologist John Freeman, a specialist in pediatric Ouch. epilepsy. The electrical activity of those seizures is interfering with their thinking, their intelligence is deteriorating, their language is deteriorating. We've been through this for three years. And I'm sure you've had families that's been through it a lot longer, but we are so agitated and no one can give us answers and we're, you know, we've asked for help for so long. There's a seizure right here, Doctor. See her head and her eyes? That's scary. I've got her. I've got her. 
I'm going to hold you. Further tests determine that Alex's seizures are coming from the left sphere of her brain. The cure is a radical surgery, hemispherectomy. What we would probably end up doing is taking out that side of the brain. A hemispherectomy, believe it or not, is taking out half of the brain. Now, that is very hard for anybody to imagine. How can you live with one half of a brain? And all I can say is you can live very well. Because they are still developing, children's brains are able to reassign most mental functions to the remaining half. But the surgery does impair peripheral vision and fine motor skills on one side of the body. But there can be serious complications, and you don't want to ever say, that person forced me into doing this, I really didn't want to do it. Uh, so everyone has to say, we really have made the best decision for our child, because you have to live with that if something goes wrong. Before making the biggest decision of their lives, they are determined to learn more about this frightening operation. So Alex's parents take her home to Indiana. You ready to go bye-bye? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Paramedics report they are bringing in a middle-aged woman who has stopped breathing. As seconds tick by, so do her chances of survival. Here we go. Critical care. Did they say they got her intubated yet? In cardiac arrest. They're trying to intubate her. Two minute ETA. So let's primary respiratory arrest. Go ahead. Serious? Cooler, are you feeling lucky? I'm feeling lucky. All right. Kathy, if you could be in charge of the airway. All right, do we have a student? Let's get a student in here to do some CPR and stuff. Find a student in um, Brigham. Right. Are you a student? All right, want to do CPR? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Have you defibrillated before? Yeah. All right, fun for the whole family. You can always tell how sick a patient is by the level of adrenaline in the room when the patient rolls in. So you can kind of look around everyone's faces and see how intense things are to determine how sick a patient is. We get suction. And you have to keep that adrenaline in check because if you have too much adrenaline, you're really going to lose your focus and people tend to start shouting a lot more. It's difficult to get things done. Can you do CPR on her, please? I'm in. Does she have a pulse? I don't have a pulse. Oh, okay. Can we get me this little betadine? Here, Brett. Here. Kathy, can you get the betadine bottle, please? Yep. She on a monitor yet? Yeah. All right, somebody working on a monitor. All right. All right, hold CPR for No, no pulse. Every bit of your training is to save lives. And there are a lot of occasions when you finally have to say, this patient has been down for 40 minutes. It's time to stop. It goes against everything that you've been taught, and that is really, really hard. No pulse anywhere? No, no cardiac activity. OK, continue CPR? See, total time. From, from arrival, yeah, it's only been 15, 16 minutes. You want a shocker? All right, let's go. go 200, 200, yes. Get your gel, get your gel. Get them together. Don't hit the red button. All right, now you've got to put about 25 to 30 pounds of pressure on it. All right, everybody clear? Go ahead. Good job. All right, we've got a rhythm. Somebody feel for a pulse down there, please. I don't get anything down here. Oh, come on. 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 Yes. Woohoo! Yeah, okay. I've got a bounding pulse right now. Do you really? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please call respiratory. I think the chest did it, Brett. I think so too. I, I, I think so. Good job, Brett. Look how regular her pulse is now. She's out of AFib and she's back in a sinus tack. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> That's a beautiful rhythm. Look at that. When traumas are over, hey, there's clearly a kind of a deep breath and a, a release of the stress. I mean, you're very excited that. You work together as a team. Boy, she's and back. How long until we got her back? 20 minutes? 20 minutes, yeah. 20 minutes. We, uh, oh, yeah, we so worked her overtime. And you realize why you put the time and the effort into emergency medicine. I, I can't imagine doing anything else. And this is what makes my job worthwhile. And what gives my life is some reassurance or some meaning.
In the lobby of the hospital's oldest building is a statue of Jesus. It's a place where some patients and their families stop to pray for good health. Alex Moody's parents have decided to go ahead with the hemispherectomy. Is that Jesus? Now convinced that this risky brain surgery is her only hope. Touch his toe. Can you see your ring? It's big, isn't it? Yeah, you guys ready for me? Okay, give me about 32 seconds and 32 and a half seconds. The doctor who will operate on Alex okay. is Ben Carson. Bye -bye considered by many to be the best pediatric neurosurgeon in the country. Good morning. Howdy. How are you? We get a little antibiotic and steroid. Since 1985, Dr. Carson has performed hemispherectomies on over 80 children. People are still astonished by the concept that you can remove half of a brain, and they can't imagine what they're going to be left with. You know, if you see the patients who've had hemispherectomies, hey, you're always amazed, you know. Here they are, you know, running, jumping, and talking, and doing well in school. Uh, they're able to live a normal life, and we anticipate a normal life for each one of them with a full life expectancy. Do we have a chart from Moody? With the case of Alex Moody, uh, th this is a, a young girl who has a developmental disorder of the brain. There's no medical protocol that's really going to be particularly helpful. So moving forward with hemispherectomy, I think it's going to be very appropriate and very uh, hopefully effective uh, in her case. But that'll be pretty much business as usual. But it is not business as usual. Less than 24 hours before the surgery, Alex's parents receive surprising news. Doctors now expect to take out even more of the brain than originally planned. Normally, we leave the very deep structures, the basal ganglia, ganglia and thalamus. Normally, we leave those structures in, but those areas are very abnormal. I think that I want to take them out. I want to get all of those abnormalities out. With the surgery now only hours away, this development leaves Alex's parents with fresh doubts and new worries. Now the most important part of the night is sleep. It's amazing what a difference a one hour or two hours of sleep will do uh, as opposed to none. This is my little closet. I have to put on three alarms, otherwise I'll never wake up. So I have my watch, I have the radio, and I have the, uh, the beeper. And I figure if all three of them fail, I was meant to sleep in. <laughs> Why am I doing this? Uh, I'm killing myself. I'm not exercising, I'm not eating. There are very few people, I would think, who can go throughout this whole thing and not have a day saying, why am I doing this? Is this worth it? But there are days when he gets to operate, and Chris Williams knows exactly why he made the choices he did. I don't think any intern ever says I'm operating too much. Uh, I decided very early that I wanted to go into surgery Surgery is a desire to learn about you know, the human body. Um, you just look at the cell interactions, muscular mechanics. And each layer is just incredibly complex, and everything is fascinating. The hope is that you operate enough to make an internship worthwhile. Oh, baby. That's enough to make your day right there to put on the opposite that good. OK, we're done. Hey, man. Have you had dinner yet? You have, so you want to have dinner now? Mary Ann Ballier, an anesthesiologist at the hospital, is his girlfriend. How are you? Fine. This is the most beautiful girl in the hospital, by the way. Some weeks, their time together is measured in minutes. Are we married, Chris? We're in <laughs> <laughs> We've only been dating for five years, you and um, we're not yet married. We're engaged. We are? No. <laughs> Nothing there yet. <laughs> I gotta run. Now that I have a little 15-minute love escapade done. <laughs> well, we went out to dinner once after uh, being in the hospital for 40, 42 hours, something like that. 
and I decided that I wanted to pretend like I was a human being. So I took her out to a nice restaurant and got this beautiful steak. And I just was uh, talking to Marianne, uh, eating an incredible steak, and I just I couldn't stay awake. I kept on falling asleep. And the waiter uh, kept on asking if I was OK. So, But that was, that was once. That was one date that we had. And <laughs> After spending a restless night, Alex Moody's parents awake with serious misgivings about the surgery. I'm not good. I'm fighting the tears, so. We studied the different lobes of the brain, and we thought that we pretty well had some kind of concept where this problem was. And so then yesterday, they uh, mentioned just kind of nonchalantly two different sections of the brain that they had never mentioned before, this thalamus and this basal ganglia. I'm supposed to have it there in 10 minutes, baby. Which got us worried. If we can't find the answers to what these words are and what these parts do, we're going to consider canceling the surgery. At least we would leave that option open. At what point during the stage here can we request to talk to one of the doctors involved, either Carson or Freeman? We need um, to request. We have a couple slight things we need answered. Okay. At the hospital, they are joined by Scott Moody, Alex's biological father. That makes it very, very serious. What they're doing. Patricia Evans tells him she may cancel the surgery. Deformities are that far down deep in the brain. They've never been that far. Do you see what I'm saying? It's still her only um, chance of giving her the best shot at life because that's what they're talking. And she can be institutionalized in the future, which is out of our hands and out of our control if she medically gets that bad. So, I mean, it's still a very good possibility, Scott, that I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I mean, that's all right. Don't be scared of me if you say no. This has got to be mutual. I mean, we can't question ourselves down the road. You gotta be positive, this is what you wanna do. I have Dr. Carson on the phone here who can talk to you if you have some specific questions for him. Dr. Carson, I'm sorry to bother you, but we, we, we did, had a couple more questions. And uh, what, does the, what does the basal ganglia do and what does the thymus do? Just briefly, I mean, just thym yeah, thymus, is that how you pronounce that? Uh, and they have done fine because I mean, Dr. Freeman had said that there was only one other surgery that where you went you went that far in and it was like a, a 14 year old boy if I'm not mistaken and he had had uh, he was really floppy uh, quote unquote for about six months after surgery so there has been more well that's what we needed Dr. Carson thank you very much what yeah. Dr. Carson said Dr. Carson said they've had they've done three of these before. Dr. Freeman said no, we've only done one. So I would take Dr. Carson word because he's the he's the one with the hands, he's the one with the knife and and I know he prays before every surgery, so we'll just put our faith in him. Making life and death decisions and, and profound decisions that affect uh, the quality of people's lives is an awesome responsibility. I'm very comfortable with, uh, with you know, most types of surgery. That's not a particular problem. But I don't think I, I would ever call it routine because uh, you always know that there's so much potential for disaster. You're digging in people's brains or in their spinal cords, you know, you're going to have life-altering events occur. And although the vast majority of them are going to be good life-altering events, there are going to be some that are going to be bad life-altering events. And you have to live with the fact that you caused that. Don't let her know if there's anything wrong with you. Alex Moody's brain surgery is expected to take at least eight hours. Oh, thank you. Give me a kiss. Love you. Big kiss, hurry. Okay, Momo, hurry. Go, right on down the line.
They just started in on the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. are you smiling yet? A little bit. A little bit. How's she doing? She's doing fine. She's asleep. And they're just getting started and everything's going very smoothly. Now, do you, do you think uh, that she'll be able to remember all of us when she gets. Of course. She'll know she all. She won't forget it. anything. Okay. Good. Never do. Yeah, this is tough, tough tissue. Yeah, fibrous. What's happening in the hemispherectomy patients is functions from one half move over to the other half. This is going to be anterior frontal. Scissor. Scissor. You can take out the right half of the brain or the left half of the brain. The plasticity works in both directions. And the reason it works so well in very young patients is because their neurons haven't decided what they want to do when they grow up yet, so they're not committed. So they can be recruited to do other things, whereas if I had amsterectomy or some other adult had one, it would be devastating. Okay, now it's going to come there. Part of the yeah. fame of the surgeons who everybody knows about comes from just being able to stand up, not leaving the table, to uh, continue to work, persevere, and control crises for 12 to 18 hours. It doesn't matter whether you're tired, you just have to do it. So it's hard. Everybody that preceded us would say, we did it, you should do it. It prepares you for those sleepless nights that you'll have. Um, but more important for when you're in the operating room uh, for certain long operations, it'll help you uh, learn to think even when you're tired. You'll learn to act even when you're tired. And there is some validity to that. It is traditional thinking at an institution steeped in tradition a place where exhaustion never excuses a mistake. Hey, Chris. Yes. So what's the plan Hold on, on Mr. L? The plan on Mr. L <laughs> is to transfer him up to get TP online, CBDL, to get a stent, a drain in the jejunum, and contrast in the jejunum. So the fact that I've been asking you all afternoon what the plan was, you knew what the plan was? Oh, he's in CBDL. I don't understand. He's in CBDL. She knew she was going to CBDL. Williams has broken a cardinal rule among interns, always keep the chief informed. Classic. Well, Richard said he had to set up the test himself. That is not true. I mean, he said, he said, okay, maybe he interpreted it that way. I called CVDL, I said I'd like to put up a stent, and then he said I'll call, and I talked to, uh, I called, okay. she'll look back, go you know, it's fine, if you think so, yeah, okay. I think I take it harder than some people, simply because I came from a medical family, and my whole life I've sort of been wanting to go into medicine and hoping to be a, a good doctor. For Williams, it has been a year of trial by fire, at the end of which a surgeon will be made, or his confidence broken. Well, my father likes to say, if you think more days about quitting than you do about how much you enjoy what you're doing, then you should probably get out and change your careers. So, so far that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Although everybody has their bad days, so I've certainly thought that uh, being a professional fly fisherman would probably be pretty good. So, in the aftermath of another all-nighter in the emergency department, staffers link up at Jimmy's Diner to unwind over eggs and beer. You know, that poor guy that I tube when they brought him in, as he was sitting up on that side of the bed, he just started to urinate on the nurse's leg. <laughs> <laughs> we were holding him up, he was just running down her <laughs> leg. <laughs> well, I was in a trauma, and they had, they, they were holding yeah. like, arms, if you would, for, for the neck, and the guy was totally Oh, no, oh, and, you're and, so and, exposed. And his penis was right in my face. I was like, OK, put something over it, because you know, like, kids will just like, <laughs> either put a foley in now or cover that up. So I was like, going, look at my daddy. <laughs> That would be bad. <laughs> Only medical people can talk about this. Yeah, at, a meal. Good at breakfast. Yeah, at breakfast. With any meal. With a beer. Yeah. At any meal. Yeah. Exactly. Any meal. Yeah. It's at, you don't want to bring it up on dates. <laughs> you know, I had this guy who was urinating all over my legs. <laughs> <laughs> The doctors and nurses in the emergency department have an amazing bond just because you are so inter-reliant on each other. It's especially important to work as a team during a trauma because time is of the essence. 
and if we are each trying to pull one way or the other, nothing's going to happen at all. Well, you know, while, while we're doing all the little things, these guys are like, are you guys ready for more atrophy? Are you ready for more epinephrine? Would you like to resume CPR? And Kathy has her own price. She ties up two nurses I by did. herself. I did. <laughs> The rest of us, we're working on our own. She's like, uh, Jim, can you, can, you, can you please come see me? You wrote my back yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're going to be gone for Christmas once. Oh. Well, you missed your first anniversary. I missed my first anniversary. That's the hard part. Everyone, attention. Congratulations to Jim uh, uh, for finishing his marathon. Uh, uh, cheers. Yeah, yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Everyone, cheers for Jim. All righty, B. Looks good. Thank you. After replacing Alex's skull, Dr. Carson puts in the final sutures. Ah, they got everybody here. How, here. how convenient. Hey, we're looking for you. Yeah, everything went very smoothly. No problems whatsoever. So, uh, the operation's all done. Fat City, all your prayers work. So far, so good. Can I ask you about the basal ganglia mm -hmm. the, um, the yeah, I was, Did you have I, to hold deep? I was able to spear most of it uh, because I could find a plane between very, very abnormal tissue and normal tissue. So there is some left then? She's still got at least half of it left. So. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. All right. See you a little later. Oh, let me. Alex. My soul baby. Alexandria, you gonna wake up and see mama? Hey, gorgeous. Alexandria. Hi there, pretty girl. Hi, baby girl. Oh, you hurt, honey. Lay oh, still, baby. Oh, much right here, honey. Oh. She looks good. I think she does. She does. Mm -hmm. She looks very good. I think she does. Yeah. Yeah. One week after surgery, Alex Moody is seizure free and on the road to recovery. Feel better now. Her eyes are open and she's acknowledging a lot of stuff and she's just doing a great job. I think all of us are just amazed at how well she's doing. You know, um, we would never guess in a million years she'd be doing this well so soon. So we're just thrilled. This is the CAT scan we did the other day. This is the brain, this is the cavity within the brain. And on this side, it's darker. That's the CSF fluid, and there isn't any brain there. Okay, you see a little bit of the thalamus and basal ganglia that we left behind. So there is, that's why she's not having any more seizures. The seizure part is gone, and she is doing just fantastically. But I don't see any good reason why she can't go home today. Great, we're excited. That's a, a, a week. Thrilled. We are more than thrilled. She was operated on eight days ago. What can we say? I mean, we couldn't have asked for one thing more. Not it's one great. thing. Are you ready? Oh. Maybe a little harder for it, guys. Come on. Come on. Are you ready? Bye, Alex. Can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Alex, slow down. Slow down man. You're in a hurry. You're doing good, baby. You're going to walk all the way? <laughs> You're gonna hold your head up? Yeah, see? Bye, hospital.